Hi guys, welcome or welcome back. Thank you so much for being here. It's so greatly appreciated, it truly, truly is. Before we get started, let me give you my usual disclaimer. This video is for educational purposes only. Please do not take what I say as fact. Please always do your own research and come to your own conclusions. Next, if you have not liked, subscribed, or commented yet, please consider doing so. It really helps me out and I really, really appreciate it. So today we are talking about 25-year-old Summer Dawn Cook Inman. She was born on December 31st, 1985 in Logan, Ohio to parents Michael and Deborah Cook. She attended the first church praise and worship center since she was a little girl and she was very passionate about the church. She was described as the sweetest person that you will ever meet, a person that would do anything for anyone and somebody that lit up a room simply by walking into it. She was not only beautiful and creative, but she was also an amazing cook. When Summer was just 15 years old, she would meet and fall in love with a 17-year-old boy named William Inman at the First Tabernacle Church. William's father actually helped build the church, and he would also play guitar and piano at Sunday services. The two would end up marrying when they were still teenagers in 2004, when Summer was 18 and William was 19. Summer would describe William as very nice, polite, and caring. She loved his family, and she believed that she had struck gold with her new in-laws. William and Summer would end up moving next door to William's parents and go on to have three children together all before Summer was able to drink legally in the United States. Bill and Sandy had a similar love story and they wanted Summer and William to mirror their relationship as closely as possible. But what's right for one couple is not always right for another. The only plus to living next door to her in-laws was that they would watch the kids whenever Summer and William asked. So this would allow the young couple to be married with children, but to also be able to go out and have fun with their friends. So <clears throat> essentially they were getting the best of both worlds. But it wouldn't take long for this fairy tale marriage to come crashing down. William had very high expectations for Summer, expectations that she was unaware of previously, and expectations that she was not willing to conform to. This is all known by diary entries of Summers that were later found. William evoked the Bible as the authority for Summers' wifely duties, duties that included sex when he wanted it, perfectly prepared meals on the table when he arrived home from work, and a spotless home. He told Summer that he wanted a polygamous marriage and 12 children. He even began looking for a second wife before the ink on their marriage certificate dried. He went so far as to download images of young women onto his cell phone, women that he found on polygamous websites. He would become possessive and violent, telling Summer that she could only go to bed after he gave her permission to do so. But it doesn't end there, friends. Of course, it doesn't end there. Does it ever? Let's be real. Summer wasn't allowed to go out, even to run errands, unless her husband or her in-laws were with her. If she did go out without them, they would time her to see how long she was gone. As time went on, Summer grew increasingly unhappy and the couple's arguments grew increasingly worse. During one argument, William drove off with the couple's cats, took them to a field, let them go in the field, and Summer never saw them again. It takes a certain type of garbage to do something like that to two innocent animals because you had a fight with your wife and you know that your wife loves her cats. In the spring of 2010, William decided to attend classes at Hocking College. He also told Summer that he wanted her to call him Will moving forward. So for purposes of this video, we will continue to call him William. 
During this time, he began carpooling to classes with a guy named Adam Peters. The two had become pretty good friends, and he would even go to Summer and William's home for dinner a few times. Summer and Adam would end up getting to a relationship behind William's back, and she would detail parts of the relationship in her diary. Entries that read... The moment I looked into his eyes, I knew the devil had me. Now I am sorry. Sorry that I didn't listen to what God was telling me. Sorry that I put myself in a bad position. A position where I could easily be taken advantage of and no one would know. He saw that in me. He saw that I was scared and it made his power even stronger. He saw that I didn't know what to do and that I couldn't tell anyone what happened. I tried to stop him, but he wouldn't. My mind was screaming, run, get out of there now. But instead, I stayed and I allowed him to dig deeper into me and pull me into his grasp. I wanted to run. Finally, I did run. I ran right into his arms and I was gone forever. I don't know if it's the right time to tell Willie or not. I feel bad not telling him because I think he deserves to know the truth and to know that I don't want to be with him right now. In June of 2010, Summer had reached her breaking point, moved into her parents' home with the couple's three children, and filed for divorce. William had warned her in the past that if she ever left him and took the kids, that he would kill her. His mother assured her that he would never do such a thing, but I would sooner listen to what Ted Bundy told me before I would listen to what Sandy Inman had to say. So it should come as no surprise to anyone that this did not go over well with William and his parents. December 1st, 2010, Summer shows up to the inmates' home with police officers to pick up some of her belongings. While there, her boyfriend and former friend of her now estranged husband shows up to help. This infuriates Bill Inman, and he begins screaming that he's going to get a gun and shoot Adam Peters. So Bill and the police officer that was there would begin struggling and the officer would be forced to tase Mr. Inman. Bill was charged with multiple citations that included resisting arrest. Now he's arguing with Summer, you know, saying that pretty much saying it was her fault. I never went into detail about it, but he was blaming her for, you know, them being evicted from the home. Summer was there at the house trying to get back some of her stuff. Deputy Kane says Summer's boyfriend showed up to help and Bill didn't like it. Well, he stands up and he goes, get off my property. Boy, he just stepped out of the car. He said he was going to shoot him. You see him turn towards the house like he was going to go get a gun. Then he starts walking towards him. I just try to stop him. That's when things go from tense to violent. And he tells me, don't you put your hands on me. He squares off with me. I said, well, you're under arrest. And the second I grabbed his arm, he just started trying to rip away from me. And here we, we have to pretty much have our struggle for... I'd say probably two or three minutes struggle. After the struggle, Deputy Kane gets the upper hand, holding Bill Inman's arms, eventually aiming a taser at him while his wife, Sandra, tries to barter. Right now they're asking, uh, can't I just forget about it? And I said, no, the second we went to the ground, I said, after all this, I said, uh, maybe the incident right there where me and him, you know, where he squared off, if he would have calmed down, it might have been a citation. Instead, several charges, including resisting arrest, And Deputy Kane also got some insight into what he perceived as control issues and a power struggle from Summer herself. She had advised that her and her husband, you know, she couldn't stand the family. Uh, Said that every time her and her husband got in a fight or something, you know, the father or the mother would be in there, you know, telling them they need to get it straightened out or they'd always get involved. I'm sure it also didn't help matters that William had seen a picture of Summer, Adam, and Summer and Adam's three children on his now ex-friend's Facebook page. This is just another reason why I say that Facebook is the root of all evil, because it causes so much unnecessary drama. (laughs) During this time, Summer began attending counseling twice a week for victims of DV, She got a night job cleaning a bank and had plans to attend the culinary arts program at Hocking College. Despite everything, Summer still kept her children in their father's life. 
the two would do pickups and drop-offs at their local police station because that was the safest. Then the Immons began accusing Adam of abusing the children. Summer and her parents steadfastly denied these claims and accused them of making up these lies as an attempt to get full custody of the children. It seems more likely than not that this is actually what they were doing, especially since Sandy couldn't have any more children after William was born and she looked at Summer's children as if they belonged to her. March 22nd, 2011, Summer made dinner for Adam, her kids, and her parents before taking Adam's car over to the bank to begin work. Adam would end up staying at her parents' house that night to wait for Summer to get home. Summer always either called or texted one of them when she was on her way home from work. So on this night, when they didn't hear from Summer, they knew that something was very wrong. Her parents went over to Summer's work and that's where they would find her iPod, her keys, and her phone battery in the trash. Summer's parents called the police immediately to report their daughter missing and told police that they believed that her strange husband and in-laws were behind whatever happened to her. She's nowhere to be found. We found her coat and her iPod. There's a restraining order against her husband. We don't know what's going on. Witnesses would come forward to say that they believe that they saw two guys in ski masks tasing a woman before throwing her into the backseat of a car and taking off. We say two witnesses saw the kidnapping take place near the intersection of Hunter and Marcus Streets in downtown Logan. Two suspects uh, dressed in uh, all black were seen forcing the female into the back of their vehicle. Immediately after seeing this, this the witnesses called 911 to report what they had just witnessed. Two witnesses that were jogging saw Summer being pepper sprayed and thrown into the back of the car. Those two witnesses ran to the police station to report what was going on. So you have witnesses calling 911 and you have witnesses going to the police station to report what is happening. These witnesses would later come out to say that they were treated as if they were fabricating the entire story and officers would inform them that they had that all their officers were currently tied up in traffic stops but that they'll get to it. It would take police an hour to get over to the bank to assess this situation. An hour. With all the information provided to police by witnesses and Summer's family, including the vehicle being driven, it should not have been difficult for officers to track Summer down and if they had taken the calls seriously from Jump Street. Who knows, they could have saved her. When officers showed up to the Immens' home, they found the white Crown Victoria in the driveway. The same white crown Victoria that witnesses had described. The Immens told police that they were in Cleveland the night that Summer went missing. But when police got a warrant for the GPS system in the crown Victoria, it told a very different story. The Immens were not in Cleveland, Ohio that night. They were in Logan where Summer was living. The GPS coordinates also brought police to a car wash. CCTV shows the Immens at the car wash the following morning after Summer went missing at 7.30 a.m. Bill, Sandy, and William got out of the car, but Summer was nowhere to be found. After they were done at the car wash, they put new tires on the car and they went home. Investigators released photos of the vehicle at the Blue Sonic car wash on Orchard View Avenue in Seven Hills. The Inmans appear to be using a vacuum to clean the interior. A surveillance camera captured the images last Wednesday morning. A couple of hours later, the Inmans took the car to a salvage yard on Pearl Road where they exchanged the wheels and tires. The reason they got rid of those tires and wheels uh, because they didn't want anybody to, to, to find out about the vehicle and, and where they were. Employees didn't notice anything suspicious, but the exchange was unusual. They were actually almost like brand new tires. 
Yeah, practically brand new. Someone bought the tires and wheels, which the FBI believes are important evidence in the case. Investigators hope that customer will come forward. There's a lot of investigation that we still need to do to find out what happened in this situation. Summer would be missing for eight days before the Inmans were brought in for questioning. William and Bill claimed that they had nothing to do with the disappearance of Summer and they refused to answer any of the police questions. Sandra Inman, on the other hand, she decided to tell police what happened that night. But not because she was racked with guilt for taking away a mother of three small children, but because she wanted the death penalty to be taken off the table for her family. She tells police that they never planned to kill Summer. They only took her because they wanted to scare her into letting them see their grandchildren. Because doesn't everybody kidnap their estranged daughter-in-law when she refuses to let them see their grandchildren? It defies logic. It absolutely defies logic. But nevertheless, this is their story. And even though I think it's complete bull, without Sandra's confession, who knows if Summer would ever be found. Sandra tells police that they waited for Summer to take out the trash from the, her bank job that night. Once they had Summer in the backseat of the car, William put three zip ties around her wrists and a fourth around her neck. The one around her neck was apparently too tight and Summer began to suffocate. So I'm not sure what they thought was going to happen when they put zip ties around her neck, but agreeing to let them see their grandchildren was probably not going to be one of those options. Sandra goes on to say that they wanted to cut the zip tie when she began to choke, but that they forgot their knife at home. As part of the plea deal, Sandra had to show police where they hid Summer's body. So Sandra took police 20 miles away from where Summer was last seen to the Faith Tabernacle Church in Nelsonville, Ohio. The same church that Summer and William met at and the same church where Summer's father-in-law ran prayer services. She brought them over to a septic tank in the back of the church. After officers removed six screws from the steel lid that sealed the septic tank, they found Summer stuffed inside of it. Officers note that the body was very much intact. She was wearing the same clothing that she was last seen in the night that she was working. Her hair was in a ponytail and t-shirt that read, I don't have an anger problem, I have an idiot problem. Because of Sandra's cooperation with police, she was given 15 years in prison. Bill and William were given life in prison with no chance of parole. Summer's three children are now being raised by her parents. All right, guys, if you're still here, thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you and I appreciate you so, so, so very much. Please leave me a like and a comment. Please subscribe if you haven't yet and you feel so inclined to do so. And until next time, stay safe out there.